So our panelists, and if you'd raise your hand when, uh, when I uh, give your name, that'd be great. Dottie Beatty. Dottie was, uh, got her nursing degree in 1967 in Rochester, Minnesota. She joined the Air Force in 1968 and served in Vietnam from 1969 to 1970 in the 12th United States Army. Uh, I apologize for that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go to confession. The 12th United, the United States Air Force Hospital in Cam Ranh Bay, Vietnam. Our next panelist is Rafael Benjamin. He served in country 1965 to 66 as a battalion surgeon with the 1st Battalion, 327th. Airborne Infantry Regiment under Colonel David Hackworth, who wrote the book About Face, which is a pretty incredible book if you ever have an opportunity to read it. And he stated he spent most of his time in the field with his 32-man medical platoon while he was in country. Charlotte Cook, she started her activism in 1961 with a band, the Bomb Rally. Was it in Berkeley? No, that was in Cambridge. It was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. From 63 to 68, she attended Berkeley and, and was involved in numerous demonstrations during that time. In 1970, her boyfriend left for Canada seeking asylum from uh, this, this war. And in 1980, she was back in Berkeley protesting the Livermore Labs and what they were doing and um, possibly are still going. And she came to Santa Fe because of her membership in Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety. Uh, Jeffrey Less, who was going to be on the panel convener today, I think he came down with the flu, or he's, he's ill nonetheless. So he was also an activist during the, during the Vietnam War. He's a retired attorney, retired in 2012. Our next panelist is Tom McGuffey. He graduated from the University of Houston in August of 1966. Wanting to become an airline pilot, he decided he could get the necessary training in the military. He joined the Marine Corps and became a pilot. <laughs> he trained on the CH-47, deployed to Vietnam 67-68 to Quang Tri province in November 68. He flew approximately 300 combat missions, including resupply, troop insertion, and extraction, which included recon units and medevac. And he stated that the recon and medevac uh, missions were the most dangerous. On 10 February 1969, during the medevac night mission, he was shot down and shot. He was met back by his wingman and within 30 minutes was in a field hospital. He remained in the United States Marine Corps until 71 when he was discharged from active duty. Tim Oregon, <laughs> who I'm so glad to see you. I love you well. Oh, graduated from Catholic Military High School in 1966. He had a four-year athletic scholarship to the University of Minnesota and quit after one year to join the Marine Corps. The, the, the football scholarship story in and of itself is, <laughs> is a really good story. Because he had one year in college, he was uh, stationed in a position in the uh, radio PR at Camp Pendleton, California. He volunteered numerous times for the infantry, which he was granted, he was sent to Vietnam during the Tet Offensive in 1968. He when he volunteered to walk on point for one patrol, he had been there three months. He lost his leg to a 105 millimeter artillery shell that had been booby trapped. And Ken Stewart was in country 67 to 1968. He first served in the Central Highlands with the 173rd Airborne Brigade's long range recon patrol during that period, which the brigade was decimated by the North, North Vietnamese Army, including a famous battle for Hill 3113. He subsequently served with the Special Forces Mobile Guerrilla Unit in the Highlands on the Cambodian border during the Tet Offensive of 1968. And that is our panel. So I'm going to, oh no, that's the panel. Here's our moderator. I'm just sucking wind all over the place. And I'm even organized. So our moderator today is Lucy Moore. Um, she is one of the country's leading mediators, facilitators, and trainers dealing with public policy and natural resources issues. She deeply believes in the rights of individuals to have a voice in how decisions are made about issue issues affecting them. She's the author of two books, one a memoir, Into the Canyon, Seven Years in Navajo Country, and a book about her mediation work, Common Ground on Hostile Turf, Stories from an Environmental Mediator. She's lived here in Santa Fe for 40 years and shares a house with her artist husband, 
Roberto Gallegos, who is also a Vietnam veteran, Marine Corps, and two cats. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and Lucy's taking over. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, so much. You're, you're not sucking wind at all. It's <laughs> great, to, great to have you here. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful full house, and I can just feel the support and the interest and the willingness to learn and to share, and that is really important to me as a mediator. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'm just honored to be on this little mini stage here with... Um, with folks you know, for whom the Vietnam era was life-changing in ways they never expected. And um, I just want you to know that I appreciate that experience that you had and sacrifices that you all made. Um, so the focus today is the Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam era. Um, how many saw at least part of it? Woo! He would be so happy. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, and we're going to be hearing from the panelists their reactions to that documentary, what rang true to them, uh, what did not ring true, what stood out, um, how did it make them feel uh, as they reflected on their own experiences. I'm going to ask a couple of questions of them. They'll have five minutes or so each. To answer, they assured me beforehand that, oh, five minutes is a long time. I certainly won't talk five minutes. We, we shall see. We shall see. I have little cards I'll hold up that say one minute and that say zero minutes. And so I, I'm not terribly comfortable with that kind of um, regimented format, but I want to be sure that everybody gets a chance to speak and also that we have a chance to hear from some of you in the audience. Um, so my, you know, my career as a mediator has taught me that it's all about telling stories and that if people can tell each other stories honestly and can listen with an open heart and an open mind, um, we can really increase our understanding of each other and in my most optimistic moment, we could make some peace. Uh, so this is a safe place for that storytelling. I want to um, um, just reassure all of you up here uh, that that's my job to uh, keep it safe and to um, make it as as comfortable for you as possible to tell us your stories which we're honored to hear and thank you all um, so let me um, begin by asking we've got two mics here this this mic will serve the three of you and then you've got a mic over there good good so, um, so, I, so the, the format is that I'll ask those couple of questions that should take an hour or so. After that, we may have, be, have, be able to have some discussion among these folks about what they have said and questions they've got for each other, whatever. Um, and then I'd like to open it up to all of you for questions of the panel or some comment of your own that you would like to make. I have a feeling two hours is gonna be really short, so I will do my best to make it productive. So the first question, and I guess I will um, just start with Tim and move my way down. Is that okay with you, Tim? Didn't, I didn't check on, you probably thought I was gonna start with Dottie and what, <laughs> do you, but no, no. Dottie defers to Tim, so, so gracious. So, so Tim, my first question is really that one I just um, uh, expressed, you know, what, I, I assume you saw at least part of the documentary and just what I know from my experience watching it with my own husband who's a combat vet that, yeah, Daniel? Can you ask people to turn off or turn down their cell phones? Ah, cell phones off, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, that watching it with my, my husband who's a combat vet, you know, I was, um, we had very different reactions watching it and, and, and so I would just be really interested, Tim, in in your reaction to the documentary, what it did to you personally, was it helpful, was it supportive of your experience, was it contradictory, whatever you'd like to offer us. Yeah, I, I watched it with my wife. Um, I, I thought the documentary was excellent. There wasn't, there wasn't anything really, there wasn't, oh, there wasn't anything really new or, um, uh, that I haven't seen or heard or something somewhere before, but I really appreciated the fact 
that uh, they showed the war from the perspective of both the U.S. soldiers, combatants, and the Vietnamese, and showed the impact that war has on, on both sides. Uh, and I, I found, uh, um, I, I actually liked Johnson in the very beginning of the, of the documentary, and then he turned out to be the guy I thought he was as time, things progressed. Um, and then uh, I think the hardest hardest part of the whole of the whole documentary for me was watching the um, the last uh, segment where they were at the um, sorry at the wall. So it was really incredibly painful to watch it. I watched every single minute. I took notes. I'm a good Berkeley student. I just took notes. I've got 20 pages of notes with me from the series. What I found was amazing was um, just watching the whole progression of how it just went to hell. And I appreciated greatly hearing the North Vietnamese folks uh, point of view, which of course we didn't get to hear, except in Felix Green's film Inside North Vietnam, which we watched at the Berkeley campus sometime in the 60s, and we realized then, as naive as we were, and we were crashingly naive, we realized that there was no way that we were going to win against these folks with their beautiful handmade bamboo water carriers. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, it brought up a lot of memories, a lot of pain. Um, just going down to the Oakland Duction Center with my roommate um, early in the morning to talk to the prospective um, military folks as they had nine feet of freedom between mom and dad and the army. And it, just trying to say, I think you've got, you have other choices. And that's all we could say, because we were so naive. Um, there was an older woman, probably my age now, standing there every single day with her picture of napalm babies. We were not we young kids. We just weren't there yet. We couldn't even handle that. But we tried to talk to them. And I just remember sort of glazed eyes staring through me at the door of, to the army and people saying, it's for my country. And it was just heartbreaking. And we went I don't know how many times. But then we gave up because we didn't feel we were making any difference whatsoever. Oh, gosh. Um, 66, maybe 67, like that. And then they changed. They, they brought uh, the young people in on buses downstairs so that we couldn't speak to them. And so that was the end of that. I think that's all I need to say right now. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. Jim? Anyway, the, I guess, as I was saying, the hardest part was the wall, watching the wall and, and seeing, and I guess it was seeing it in the context of, of where we are today, uh, seeing, again, all the lives that were lost, uh, rem remembering all the people that had, um, that had died that I knew that were either, either when I was in Vietnam or that I knew I was in a, a military hospital for a year. We really lost people there as well. And then to look at in the context today where the same things are happening over and it's as though uh, it was for, I don't know what the reason was, why any of us went, why we did what we did, because nothing's changed. We've got the, we've got the same thing going on, if not worse, with the, the current people in charge. So that's, that's good enough for me. Ken. Well, um, I was born and raised in the military, and it was a uh, rite of passage. You get hair on your chest, you go to war, all that kind of bullshit. And I really believed it, and um, watching this series, it, um, it was really painful. There were three, 400 people, men mostly, dying every week when I was there. That's incredible that that went on for 10 years and uh, nothing changed. I'm still uh, can be just as pissed off now as I was then, 
I was probably, I'm probably more pissed off now because I'm less scared because it's a little bit more distant. Um, it was a terrifying experience for everybody that was there one way or another. People that didn't get shot at, but people were just there were going through traumatic stuff. Um, and it's, at some point, I'm speaking for myself anyway, I think everybody's a dupe that ends up in that position. And it's like horrible. People are dying, they're doing, I mean, there were incredible um, demonstrations of bravery and heroic and personal sacrifice that were just mind-boggling. And at the same time, there was some really horrible shit that we did. And, uh, and I'm included. Um, and again, like you were just saying, it's, we keep doing this. We keep doing this. It took 10 years to stop this war. We're in 14, 15 years in Afghanistan. It's, uh, it just doesn't make sense. We're making the same mistakes and the people who are paying for it aren't the people that start the war or encourage it or make money off of it. It's all these other vets in the crowd up here. It's the people. We're all suffering. The people in Vietnam got totally screwed. They got screwed by the North. They got screwed by the South. They got screwed by us. And that was a really important part of the, the uh, series. Uh, it's, I'm getting a lot of negative stuff on my email from a bunch of Special Forces group people who are more conservative, still hate Jane uh, Fonda and with a passion. I mean, get off of it. It's 50 years ago. We all did some really stupid shit 50 years ago. Um, but so it's hard for even in 18 hours to generalize an experience that for most of, for at least up up here, was very personal and um, life changing in ways that you can never imagine. And uh, I didn't get a hairier chest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. And Ken uh, has a book um, that is over there on the table that's a really fine piece of work. Thank you, Ken. All the profits go to the Veterans for Peace. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Rachel Benjamin. Um, I can't say that I'm from a military family, but my father, brother, and brother-in-law were all in the military. Um, I, uh, when, I, when I finished um, my internship in Houston, uh, like so many other young doctors that age, I was drafted, although I, I tried to get uh, what was then called a, 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 a berry deferment. But uh, didn't luck out there. So anyway, uh, got drafted, spent uh, four weeks at uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio learning who to salute. And, uh, and then spent a wonderful uh, year at Sandia Base in Albuquerque, uh, where I was, just, I was a general medical officer. Uh, and I was the first medical officer on Sandia base to get orders to go to Vietnam. I mean, talk about a surprise. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I went over to Vietnam with the 70th Engineer Battalion, uh, and this was 65, and we went over as units on ships. Uh, and that was a 21-day trip, which was wonderful because we were very well taken care of on, on the ship, and 21 days counted against your, your one-year tour uh, in <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, so then I went over, like I said, it was the 70th Engineer Battalion, and um, at some point I transferred uh, to the 101st, and what happened was one of my classmates from medical school came through and said, oh, come on, we, we need you. And, I think Karen has finally forgiven me for that. So I, I went from the 70s engineer to the 101st, and uh, ultimately became a uh, battalion surgeon to the 1327. Uh, my commanding officer was generally uh, David Hackworth, uh, who was at that point uh, one of the more famous uh, officers in the U.S. Army with decorations and Purple Hearts and all of that. 
And so I ended up spending most of my time in the field. Uh, and what I really noticed in, from my experience to watching the series was how lucky I was to never get into a situation where we were just stuck there being bombarded for days on end. Uh, and, you know, I used to think that we were living like animals in the field. But the, the truth is those troops in these, in, you know, Quezon or, or whatever, Confian, dug into these muddy holes and living there for weeks and months on end. I, I just can't imagine that. And so I was really lucky, uh, uh, you know, to have to do what I did uh, for a day or two at a time, and then we would go back to our base camp. And that's about what did I, and what did I think about the series? Well, Karen and I were on vacation for the last 30 days, so we elected not to watch it while we were on vacation. I have since seen, I guess, two-thirds of it. And um, it, it affected me, you know, to, to see all this military and civilian suffering, uh, so much of it uh, dishonorable, uh, especially against the civilians. And um, <coughs> that was painful for me. But the other interesting part of this is I, I get emails, mostly from Ken Mayer of Veterans for Peace, telling more or less about the, the deficiencies of the series uh, depicting the bad stuff we did. And then I get other emails from my 101st guys uh, indicating, and uh, backing it up with, his, with historical facts on their point of view uh, about how deficient the series was uh, depicting the atrocities that the, the North Vietnamese uh, did. So anyway, you know, it's uh, like, like everything else in life, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of gray there. A lot of black and white, but also a lot of gray. And uh, hey, like everybody else, I'll live through it. Thank you, Phil. Here we go. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tom McGuffey. Uh, I was a helicopter pilot, Marine Corps helicopter pilot. Um, I thought the series uh, was hard to watch. Um, and the more I watched, the worse it got. I thought the first two series were the best. Um, the first series, as you know, uh, sort of explained how it all happened, and why we were there, and um, the mistakes we made, I think. And to me, I, it, it was all the um, anti-communist furor of the 1950s that led us into Vietnam. I mean, we were involved from World War II on, but the 50s really stimulated that anti-communist fervor, um, which led us into this, and, let, and, and, and I think we're still suffering with. Um, the second series uh, was about the beginning of the war, and, and I thought um, uh, Neil Sheehan, who was a reporter there, um, was introduced in that series, and, and to me, uh, he wrote the best book on Vietnam that I've read. It was called The Bright Shining Lie, and it was a biography of John Paul Van. John Paul Van went to Vietnam as an advisor, I think, in 1962. He had been a, 
uh, a, um, I think he started off in the Army Air Corps in World War II, but he was a lieutenant colonel when he went to Vietnam, and he spent a year there, and he kept running into the problem of uh, the Vietnamese would not fight, and he would report this to his superiors, and they would reject the information. And so he spent a year of frustration there, and then uh, went back to the U.S. and retired from the Army. And then he went back, and this was 1963, when he went back in 1965 as a civilian, uh, with USAID, and he ended up being the head of USAID in Vietnam. He spent 10 years there. He was killed in 1972 in a helicopter crash, but uh, his experience was just incredible. The other book uh, that I read that sheds a lot of light on the, on the causes of our involvement was The Embers of War by uh, Frederick uh, Lodgeville. And it really uh, paints the picture of our involvement and the French involvement, and the French were really our surrogates after World War II, uh, and how this all um, progressed. Uh, in preparation for today, I started looking for other reviews of the series, uh, and I found a review uh, uh, from the uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, which is the largest Vietnam veteran organization, has about 75,000 members. And uh, if you're interested in reading it, uh, you can just Google uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, Ken Burns documentary, and, and you'll see their review. And it's not very long, but I thought it was very good. And the writer, um, starts off thinking that he's not going to like the series because Ken Burns did not ask the, the VVA to have any input in the series. So he thought that it was probably going to uh, denigrate uh, veterans. But uh, it went, and I, I'll read a little excerpt that he wrote. He said, uh, the, Viet the Vietnam War documentary does not do anything whatsoever to demean, demonize, or denigrate the service of American uh, men and women who served in the war. Uh, and also, um, I thought uh, we ought to have uh, kudos for the veterans who uh, commentated on the series throughout. I thought they were all uh, well-spoken. And also, uh, the Viet Cong and the NDA and the civilians, and especially uh, Dong Van Mai Elliot, the woman who spoke, I think, on every series, and I thought she was especially uh, good. <laughs> Um, I thought you might want to hear some some of the attitudes from okay <laughs> from our uh, that our squadron had, uh, and we didn't flinch from any mission, but we were always cautious in execution. Uh, no politics, no religion, uh, no flag waving. Uh, our primary mission was to survive. Lots of booze, lots of poker, and no drugs. Thank you. Well, this is kind of a surprise because I just came to watch. <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me. <laughs> Daniel's pretty persuasive. <laughs> yes, <it's hard. laughs> oh, okay, is that better? Okay. So, the series was really impactful for me, and I found myself switching between the 23-year-old who was over there and served, and the person that I am now. And it was, it was 
a little disconcerting to go back and forth so much. But one of the things that really impressed me is, I remember just the horror I saw in the eyes of all my patients. And through the series, I could better understand what they had gone through. And it made me really appreciate the wonderful character that they had and, and what they lived through. Um, on the first ward I was in, we also had um, Australians, we had North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, VC. Um, we didn't have any civilians because they had their own ward. But, but the eyes were all the same. And I think that's the thing that really sticks with me, always, always. The other thing that impacted me was I could never, ever say enough about the corpsmen that I worked with. They were amazing people. Um, like we had a 68-bed ward, and there were two corpsmen and myself usually on it. When I went to the ICU, it was a 12-bed ICU with a pre-op, post-op, two corpsmen and myself. And they were amazing. It was just unbelievable what they could do. In the film, I could see what they did in the field, and I was even more impressed. I mean, these were young men. They were younger than I was. I was an old lady over there. And yet the responsibility and the care that they gave brought me a lot of patience. And, and I think that really impacted me. And then that carried me over to what it must have been like for the Vietnamese. You know, even the South Vietnamese Army didn't have the support that we gave. And the North Vietnamese, what it would be like to see people in pain and I think the hardest was like the civilians. On the ICU, we sometimes got kids that had been badly injured, and I don't know how they made it to our ward, but they did. But their parents never got to come visit on the base. And I just thought how terrifying that would be. And then that brings me around <coughs> to what's going on in our world today. And to think that collateral damage doesn't mean anything, but it means those eyes. You know, it's those babies, it's, it's parents, it's brothers, it's sisters. Collateral damage is personal. And how we've been able to make that not happen. I understand in war you need to stereotype the enemy if you're fighting. At least that's my understanding. So you need to <coughs> demonize them. But for us to be able to do what we do, I think around so many civilians is very difficult for me to understand. So the series, I thought, was excellent. Um, I was numb a lot of it as I watched it because it's too hard to go back and live those things again. But I like the way that, as you all said, multiple sides were presented because in a war, everybody's involved. It's not just a few people. And, well, I guess I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Dottie. Thank you, all of you, very much. So I have another question, I probably have a lot of questions um, that I'd like to just, uh, I'll throw one out there and anybody that would like to respond, uh, if, it, um, if it piques your interest, you've got something to say, uh, jump in. Um, I was struck by the variety, the huge variety of voices that were in the documentary and I wondered what it was like for those of you whose voices were so singular and so strong, uh, what it was like to hear and see those other characters in the tragedy that you were involved in, um, uh, whether there were surprises for you or um, uh, what that was like. I just can't help but imagine it was uh, powerful. Anybody like to respond to that? I'll volunteer. Great. Thank you. <laughs> terrible, terrible words. But, uh, uh, I really was appreciative of the fact that every one of those people that were uh, interviewed uh, spoke personally uh, about their own, and they weren't too shy about um, how hard it was or how freaky it was. And uh, all of them. And I think that's why they chose those. I don't know if they had a bunch of people they didn't bring in, but uh, they all were really good. And I think that's one of the um, important things about um, 
stopping this kind of shit from continuing is that you speak personally and it's 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 a rip off you know every veteran who serves you know is getting ripped off really um and when you go into the war i mean like look what's happening with our vets right now they're really they're, they're not getting the benefits or cutting benefits at the same time asking them to do more and um i I mean, I appreciate every single one that they chose for that. I mean, there's other stories that didn't get told, because how can you tell millions of stories in uh, even 18 hours? So. But that's what impressed me, mm -hmm. was they, they weren't shy, they weren't afraid to be, you know, vulnerable. And, you know, that's true of everybody, whether we met it or not, that, you know, gets in that situation. Great. Other thoughts on that? On the on the other voices you heard, <coughs> other faces you saw? I was really impressed with uh, everybody, the, the Americans <coughs> in, in the North and South Vietnamese. I was impressed with their eloquence. I mean, it was just amazing that they could share these really painful thoughts so eloquently and basically not break down. And I, you know, I'm, I know this is from other uh, things I've watched about this series. Speak up, that, please. Say that again? Speak up. Microphone closer, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I know, but this was done in a, sort of in a studio situation. I mean, these people were just out uh, on the street uh, being interviewed. Uh, it was in a very controlled situation with sound people and, and uh, video people. But their, their eloquence was, was quite amazing. And the other thing, this is a, a stupid little aside, I think, but the, the old men in, from North Vietnam, my age, had terrible teeth. <laughs> and that must be so uncomfortable, you know, for them. And, and it was kind of uniform. I was just kind of, I was kind of amazed. Uh, but but the, but the, the the eloquence was there. And uh, Dottie, uh, being a retired dentist, has put in her papers to go back to North Vietnam <laughs> and, and treat some of these uh, dental problems. Great, Th thank you, Raphael. And I mean, that, that points out the fact that so many years have gone by and you, you know, that's been different for, for you and for the Vietnamese North and South as well. So some of us have had the benefit of Dottie's care and others and have got our teeth and others don't. And that's just a, a small, one of the small differences probably in the, the that have, what the intervening years have been like. You know, one other thing, uh, Karen and I went back to Vietnam in 2000, and I can't remember whether this happened then or when I went back with my grandchildren in 2005, but almost every military, every South Vietnamese military veteran had spent months and years in re-education camps. I mean, it was, you know, you know the uh, the uh, rickshaw driver, that's not the right word, but the rickshaw driver, you know, had spent years in a, a re-education camp mm -hmm. and had, had had a real life before that. I don't know what his life was like mm -hmm. after that. But uh, it was the, uh, the post-war years, I think, were really tough on the, pe the people we left. <laughs> the people we left behind, as we also did in Iraq, uh, the people we left behind. Yeah, Tim. The other thing I just was saying it was the fact that I was, I was impressed. One of the things about this, the series is that you get a, a real sense of the, the truth of what war is about, and you don't see that. That's something that I think most I mean, when you go in the military, there's a, after you go through boot camp and everything else, you're all, you're all kind of uh, trained into a, especially in the Marine Corps, into a, a brotherhood that never ends. 
and when you're when you're in country, uh, every day is a life or death uh, moment, and it bonds you that much closer. And when you come back and tell stories, the people that you can tell your stories to are other veterans. But when you tell stories to civilians in America, civilians in America are clueless. I mean, so the, when we go to when we would speak at high schools and things, kids love to hear all of the gruesome details of war, but people don't really know what that is. And the thing that was fascinating with the, with the series is that you were not only talking to the soldiers, the combatants, but also the victims of, of war. And that's something that's, that is unknown to most Americans. They don't, they don't have a sense of what that means. And that's probably got something to do with why it's so easy for us to re-engage every time some politician uh, has an urge. You know, and if, if we had a better sense or our, um, maybe more of these series or more exposure, then uh, maybe there would be less of that. So. Good. Thank you, Tim. Other thoughts from the panel at this point? Yeah, Charlotte. Mm. <laughs> no, no, I prefer you. I just love Okay. Yeah, you'll get it back. I was, you were asked about the voices that we heard. I was um, once again absolutely appalled by the way the presidents spoke in this film. And of course we have one of those right now, but um, just the crass, disgusting way that they spoke about humans and about decisions, I just, I was screaming at my television again, you know, again, you know, just, I just have to say that. I want to say there's this big um, glorification of war in our culture, and even today, you know, thank you for your service. Oh, no, I mean, that's just so trite. The uh, fact is, I mean, we all have different kinds of experiences, but um, I was in pretty small uh, unit uh, activities. We weren't like in big, you know, 30, 40 guys with just small units. And uh, even in those units, there was a lot of animosity. The lifers, you know, I had the same rank as people who had been in 20 years. And I had a bad young attitude, and I'm sure I pissed them off. They wanted to kill me. I mean, and, and that's true. I mean, when life becomes so cheap, you're killing, and, and it's easy to kill. Somebody pisses you off, kill them. And that's a fairly dramatic you know, transformation, you know, and uh, you, you're with a bunch of people who are very different, um, and I, I mean, I didn't, maybe it's only in the Marines, I don't know, but in my unit, I mean, there was a lot of animosity, and there were people that wanted to kill each other, and people tried to kill each other, and people did kill each other, American, non-American, and uh, if you put people in a position where Killing is okay. Raping, pillaging, killing is okay. There's no boundaries and stuff. Um, bad stuff like that happens, and that's that's a that should be you know that should be part of our culture too. It's not just like the glorious warriors and the band of brothers, and, that, and I'm sure there's some bonding and stuff that goes on, but that wasn't my personal experience, and um, it's the toll that people pay when they go over. Even these guys nowadays are maybe not seeing so much action, but almost are being threatened. They're, they're traumatized. They are majorly messed up people. And we do that as a culture. We send people there to do that and experience that and end up totally screwed by it. And we don't give them the back end of that. The benefits are if you're going to go and be in that position and do your duty and whatever to God and country and stuff like that. We are owed that back end, you know, and um, we just keep getting more and more ripped off instead of, you know, paid back. And, you know, um, the, the thing that impressed me most coming back from Vietnam was not the people calling you baby kid or spitting on you. I never saw any of that. It was apathy. Apathy. You know, I'm doing my other thing. I got this girlfriend, boyfriend thing, and whatever, and stuff like that. And uh, you know, and that's still an American problem, and we still have to deal with that. And it's apathy for the people that go over there, the people that are suffering there. They were, you know, I could go on to a rant. I'll stop. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, sort of as an, an aside to what Ken was saying is, um, I had nothing but support when I came back from Vietnam. You know, as, as you mentioned, none of none of the baby killers spit on me. You know, but it was early, and I came back to a, you know a very stable place, and I was no longer in the military. Uh, when I came back, I got I had the good sense to get out. Um, but so I, I, I never I never had that feeling. But but really, there's there's nothing about this film and war that's unusual. If we don't like it, we have to not do it. So that's the thing. Let's. Let's stop doing it. Well, following up on that, I did a little um, Google search. Our military budget for this coming year is $824.7 billion. Um, we're running a worldwide empire. We have 300,000 troops deployed overseas right now. We have 97,000 troops in Europe. We have 63,000 troops in Asia. We have 26,000 in the Middle East. We have 3,000 in Africa. There are 32,000 more elsewhere. It's just ridiculous, and I don't know why we keep doing it. I don't know. Last number I saw was a little over three hundred thousand dollars between one country. Let's get the. I'm sorry. Let's get the mic back to Tim, and I'll get the mic. If you're disabled, the, uh, this was this was like four or five years ago that I looked that up. The, if you're disabled and you happen to live, we, we die sooner if you're disabled, so we save you money. But um, if you happen to be disabled, it costs somewhere around uh, one and a quarter million to care for us until, until we finally die. So for every one of these wounded, and that's if you, that's if you, as, as Ken was saying, when you come, when you come back, uh, the biggest war that you have to fight is with the people that are supposed to, that have promised to care. And you have to go in and have all your benefits denied and appeal. And you know, we've gone. My wife and I have gone through years of appeals trying to get benefits that were that were promised, <coughs> and we've gotten eventually gotten what what we had sought. But the the battle is ongoing. The the war never ends. The war the war now becomes a war between the veteran and his government. So. I, I'm finished. Well, it's kind of a recap of what you all had said. I think one of the things that was the hardest for me to hear was each president saying, I know we can't win this war, but after I get reelected, then I'll do something. And how does that disconnect happen? That so many people can be worth your reelection. Re that was really hard for me. And I think it's one of the things I still deal with today is the why the why of what I saw. And I, I just can't find anything that will answer that, that gives me peace. But I like the fact that it was addressed. Great. Thank you. Others, anything you want to, any threads you'd like to pick up here? Or I'm gonna, pretty soon, gonna open it up. Daniel. Can, I, I think the comment on what Dottie just said, yeah. So, um, my generation, the why, the, the older, awful George Bush, it's the economy, stupid. I mean, he wasn't talking about war per se, but, you know, it always comes down to this. And when I deployed to Iraq, um, the army screwed up and educated me in university. I became an officer, so I went through training while I was in university. And, you know, I had to study communist foreign policy. I had to study all sociology, all these things. And 
And it always came back to this. I don't give a damn what they say. They wave a flag left and right, but a lot of those people waving the flag, they're not the ones deploying. They're not even joining peacetime military. And um, when I went to Iraq, I knew exactly why the hell I was going to Iraq. It wasn't about, you know, supporting like the democratic, what was, you know, Vietnam was about the democracy of the government there. Kuwait, I mean, they had basically had slaves there, you know. Two-story buildings with an elevator, gold-plated, come on. It, I always knew it was about that, but I didn't have it within myself to say, no, I won't go, you know. It was that whole mentality of esprit de corps, don't let down the unit, blah, blah, blah. And it's really easy to say all that stuff when you're not the one in a position to deploy, or even to enlist, you know. Like, look at all these people today who wave the flags, like, if you're in your 20s, shut your damn mouth and go enlist. You know, if you talk so much shit about supporting your country, put your money where your mouth is instead of the poverty draft as it exists today. So when I went in, in 90, I deployed in early 91, I, I already knew it was about this, you know. You know, if it was banana, I always say this, if it was about bananas, it wouldn't have happened, but you go back to see what the Marine Corps did back in the early 1900s, it was about bananas. And you go to Central America, it not, the details change, but the dynamic doesn't. Certain people send certain other people who are for certain things. And, and even the ones who think they win, they're still losing, so, um, which is a whole other trip. Great, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, uh, something Daniel uh, said that, that reminded me of some of the, uh, I'll say, uh, right-wing emails I've had from my uh, 101st people, and that during the Vietnam War uh, and the protesters, and I'm, I'm not sing sing singling you out, but this is a general thing with the protesters, uh, this professor of philosophy noted that, and I don't remember what year the draft ended, but when the draft ended, her classes emptied out. There were no more students in her classes because they didn't have to worry about staying in college to beat the draft. So, I mean, there's, there's all kind of different ways you can, you can spin this stuff. And I, I, I can't blame these kids for not wanting to get drafted and go to Vietnam. But uh, uh, it, it, it sounds like from this philosophy professor that many of the students were in college or at least in her, her philosophy class so that they, they would not have to worry about the draft. That's okay. <laughs> oh, and one more thing, uh, David Hackworth, who was the most decorated living American soldier, when he was stationed at, uh, what, what's out in Seattle? Seattle, Tacoma? Lewis. When he was stationed at Fort Lewis, he was uh, counseling a stu uh, <coughs> draft age people of how to avoid the draft. And this was a guy with two DSCs and nine Purple Hearts. Well, I, we haven't mentioned it, but maybe a bunch of you people have had that experience. There's a lot of people that did incredible, imaginative, brave things to get out of going. That's as much as our culture is going. And, um, um, and they paid some dues, you know, some of them. I mean, I had a friend who I'll uh, immortalize by saying uh, he was a terrible soldier and his uh, sergeant was going to send him to the front. Uh, because he was such a screw-up. And uh, he was a medic, but basically a typist, a clerk typist. He didn't really do much medicine, but he was a medic. And the sergeant said, uh, you know, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to send you to the front. You, you pissed me off. And uh, he thought about it for a little bit, I guess. He went into a bunker. He took off all his clothes except his boots, his hat, lit a joint, smoked it, and walked around the rear area. The next day, he was in the United States at Fort Lewis, Washington. <laughs> So it's immoral to be nude and inappropriate, but not to kill and rape and pillage. <laughs> anyway, great.
Um, Charlotte, do you want to, uh, I'd be interested in, in hearing more from you about the protest side, people that were protesting with you, yeah. if, if you feel like it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be drafted. I was really pissed off that women weren't drafted because I wanted to go to jail. And <laughs> for what that's worth. Um, there, there are ways, of course. No, but I wanted to go that way. <laughs> um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, well, I know somebody who shot his toe off so that he wouldn't go. I know somebody who, with the help of his local doctor in Berkeley, lost so much weight that he couldn't possibly go. Um, yeah, there were a lot of different ways to do it, I guess. Um, uh, thinking about going to Washington, I, I was working at Harvard in the library in 1970 in May when it came out that Nixon was bombing Cambodia. And I had only been working for about three days when Harvard University had to shut down because they were so afraid of what was gonna happen. So immediately a whole bunch of us jumped in cars and went down to Washington to protest. And I thought, wow, this is a great new job, man. This is really working for me. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. It just was an incredibly painful time. And very wonderful in many ways too. Being a student at Berkeley, having the total freedom that we had back then, which is completely the door is slammed shut on freedom today for young people. And at the same time, just feeling desperate about this war and just hating, hating the president so much. And waste more land, as we called him. Um, anyway, that's, that's it for now. Great. And did you have contact with vets when they came back? Did you? I did not, and I never heard of anybody throwing tomatoes and things at buses, and I was in the Bay Area. But my healing, for years I felt that I didn't know anything about the military, didn't come from a military family, and my healing has been hanging out with people like Tim and Bob over there and Daniel. Um, they beautifully and welcomed me into Vets for Peace. And one of the greatest moments for me was to host a North Vietnamese, or formerly North Vietnamese woman in my house. She was part of the Agent Orange um, delegation that came to the United States and we couldn't say a word to each other, but we absolutely spoke with our eyes. And every morning I woke up, she'd be um, caressing my houseplants and singing. And just to have her in my house felt like such an honor. And that whole feeling of, wow, there is some peace that can happen with people who were technically on opposite sides of things. So um, that, that was a great experience. And thank you, Vess, for peace for that. You've taught me a lot. Thanks, Charlotte. I was going to just, just kind of echo what you were saying. When I came back, I never never had anybody call me anything. I, had, I wasn't a baby killer. I had most of the time what was happening was people were taking you out to a bar and getting you drunk or taking you out and getting you stoned or something. And I never, never really had any of the, any of the issues that, I'll see this. I don't know where these where these veterans were that were being spit on and and abused. And when you think about that in the in the context of what we did, uh, when when you open fire on a village or you you bomb a village or you mortar a village, uh, your your ordinance doesn't doesn't stop when it comes to civilians. We did kill men, women, children. That was part of the mission was to to accomplish what you were out there to do and and be done with it. So. When somebody somebody would have been calling me a baby killer, I, I don't think that they would have been been wrong in what they were were saying. I mean, that's that is what war is about. And kind of like Raphael said, if you if you don't want to be a baby killer, don't go kill babies. I mean, that's do, find something else to do with your life. Go help babies. You know, do something. So, but anyway, I mean, I, I I was in a commune when I came back, and so it was. I don't remember much of my return. So. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Others want to weigh in on the panel? Pretty soon I'm going to open it up to you folks out there. Let me just say one minor thing. and I, I, I think, I hope, I don't have any real reason to, to know this, but I think that the, the, the Vietnamese have gotten over this more readily than we have. 
Well, both North and South, I'm talking about, yeah. But uh, Hackworth went back to Vietnam doing some research for his book, and he met his counterpart in a, in a battle that had taken place in XYZ province. And Hackworth had been badly wounded uh, in the leg, and his counterpart, the Vietnamese colonel, North Vietnamese colonel, had lost part of his leg. And, and they got along famously uh, on this trip, you know, drinking beer together, spending time together. And the Vietnamese guy said, uh, Hackworth said, oh, I got a, he got a bad wound in his shoulder in his leg. And the Vietnamese guy said, uh, well, I guess you had better doctors than, than we did since I lost my leg. But anyway, I, I think it, it is possible to put us behind us. Um, and uh, I, I feel hopeful that we can, we can do that. I mean, I, you know, there's not a whole lot of time left for most of us vets. Um, but uh, we should be able to put it behind us. Uh, the North and the South in America did fairly well with that. Although uh, there, are certain, there, are certain things, there, are certain, there are certain things you don't want to talk about. Uh, in uh, the Deep South, but, but anyway. I, I just want to say it's important that uh, this is a real gray-haired group here, and um, what's important about 50 years later in Vietnam is making sure that the history gets told, whatever your part was, whatever, because the kids don't have a clue, and they're going to be screwing up, and they're going to be going to wars, and they're going to be getting messed over by the same cultural system that put us there, so... I just want to make sure that's Great. Charlotte Hutt. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Rafael and I are both in, involved in an organization called the, the Vietnam Project. And, what, and it's a local charity uh, that was started by uh, Marty Friedman and his wife Fong. Uh, and what we do is uh, we send people this, this is all done in Vietnam. We send people to school, both uh, grammar school and, and high school and college. Uh, we build houses. We provide heart surgery for children. Uh, we provide uh, business uh, investment uh, for small business and uh, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a very uh, valuable uh, local resource. Thank you, Tom. And just, I just want to link that to the idea of healing. Is that, uh, does that uh, fit in that category? I, you know, I think so. I just wanted to say one, a couple of concrete things about the Vietnam Project. <coughs> Basically, we, we raise $40,000 a year locally, just from, from everybody. Uh, we have absolute, not absolute, I think our overhead per year is $20. And that goes, that goes to the state of New Mexico for some form we have to fill out. Uh, and then Marnie and Phone go over and they spend about four months in, in Vietnam, mostly in, in the South, um, building, rebuilding huts, sending kids to school, uh, there's, for some reason in this province, there's a, a, a lot of uh, congenital cardiac problems. And uh, the people in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, have uh, got the training uh, to correct, do open heart surgery on these kids. So anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, organization. And uh, I'll be happy to send out more information if you'll give me your emails on your way out. And like I said, no, no overhead. Money and phone. When they go back, they they pay for all of their expenses out of their own pocket, not out of the treasury. Thanks, Rafael. Uh, Charlotte. Speaking of healing, I'm a massage therapist, and ten years ago, I was working on a Vietnam vet, and he suddenly remembered something that he had completely forgotten about. He was in the jungle. A North Vietnamese person came out of the jungle. The two of them were there facing each other. 
the North, and there was that ghastly moment, they both had guns, and the North Vietnamese man said in broken English, I'm not a killer. And he said, I'm not a killer. And they turned around and they both just melted back into the jungle. What a, what a moment. And that was during a massage. That was loose, loosened some cells and wow. Yeah.